Berlin, the capital of Nazi Germany and Hitler's power base. A gleaming city at the heart of the Fuhrer's plan for an empire to outshine the Romans. Adolf Hitler fancied himself as an architect. But then the Russians arrive, and Hitler must prepare Berlin for battle. It was all about elevating the most powerful cannons above the city rooftops. The city becomes a fortress. Buried at its center, the indestructible Führer bunker. This is where Hitler's going to make his last stand. One million Russian soldiers, five layers of Nazi defenses, and a battle to decide the future of the world. This is the story of Fortress Berlin. Nazi Mega Weapons is made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The biggest construction projects of World War II. Ordered by Hitler to secure world domination. Now they survive as dark reminders of the Fuhrer's fanatical military ambitions. These are the secrets of the Nazi Mega Weapons. April 28, 1945. The tanks of the Soviet Red Army roll through the streets of war-torn Berlin. German troops, many just children, lie in wait to defend their city from the Russian hordes. 18-year-old soldier Dieter Bukowski will be an eyewitness to these unfolding events. All over the city are haunting reminders of these last days of the Nazi capital. Historian and World War II expert Michael Dempsey has spent years piecing together the evidence. The Battle of Berlin was of a scale we can scarcely imagine. Over a million Soviet Red Army soldiers are entering the city. Less than 100,000 are defending it. The scale, the intensity, the brutality of this Battle of Berlin would beg a belief but for the evidence. Just 10 years earlier, in 1935, the picture was very different. Berlin was the seat of Nazi power a cosmopolitan world city and one of the cultural capitals of Europe. Hitler and his chief architect, Albert Speer, had embarked on an ambitious construction program to transform the skyline of Berlin. Adolf Hitler always fancied himself as something of an artist, as perhaps an architect, a man with high cultural pretension. Colossal government buildings, airports and stadiums all showcased at the 1936 Olympic Games. Hitler had even greater plans for the capital, to make it the center of a thousand-year Reich that would match the Roman Empire in scale and longevity. Hitler's new created Berlin with its vast domes, huge streets, massive, giant, outsized edifices. This is very much part of the German psyche. Hitler lays the foundation for his thousand-year Reich by conquering large swathes of Europe. But in 1944, British and American troops land on the French coast and advance from the west. In the east, the Russians push back from Stalingrad until they cross the frozen river Oder bringing them to within 30 miles of Berlin and Hitler. The Allies are on the verge of ending World War II in Europe. The battle along this river could decide the fate of Germany. All the weapons you have are the last we have. You must fight fanatically to stop the Russian offensive. Hitler will never surrender. 
He's a man of extremes. So it's the thousand year Reich or it's collapsing in Armageddon. There's no middle ground. It's always one or the other in his mind. The Fuhrer clings to the hope that one of his wonder weapons might yet turn the war back in his favor. To buy time, he holds out in Berlin, creating a castle of concrete and steel and ordering every last German to defend it to the death. Berlin, of course, is going to become a fortress because it's the capital of the Third Reich. This is where Hitler's going to make his last stand. Hitler's plan is to encircle Berlin in five layers of formidable structures, starting with the first obstacle, 36 miles of tank traps at Zelo Heights, an outer ring of defense including the Telto Canal, an inner ring at the stronghold of Tempelhof Airport, three enormous flak towers, a final layer of waterways, and the core of the fortress, the citadel. It is here that the Reichstag and Hitler's bunker are located. This is a car park in the middle of Berlin, probably the most interesting car park in the world given that it is the authentic historical site of Hitler's bunker. 26 feet beneath this parking lot are the remains of the infamous Führer bunker. After the war, the Allies tried to demolish it to prevent it becoming a Nazi shrine, but it was too strong. And it wasn't until 1988 that the lid of that concrete case was actually destroyed over a six-month period. The story of its construction and the start of Fortress Berlin begins with Allied bombing raids over the capital. The Fuhrer no longer feels safe. From the outset, Hitler has always been a bit obsessed with being underground. I, it, it goes back to his experiences in the trenches in the First World War. You find a lot of people who've lived through the First World War, they feel secure underground. There is already an old air raid shelter under the chancellery, but Hitler demands something much deeper and tougher, an engineering challenge in this city. The geology here in Berlin is difficult to build on. It's sand, simply, with a groundwater indeed. When they were building the bunker, they actually were dropping in prefabricated concrete slabs into this watery foundation to ensure that the concrete will not have a problem setting. The Nazis bury the Führer bunker deep beneath the Chancellery Gardens. There are 30 small rooms distributed over two levels, and Hitler's room is in the deepest section with the most protection. 25 miles south of Berlin, in the town of Zossen, are the remains of another Nazi complex that gives a unique insight into Hitler's bunker. Former Armored Squadron leader Nigel Dunkley is an expert in the fall of Berlin. Right, here we are in the Sossen Wunsdorf bunker complex. This bunker complex was built by the same company that also built Hitler's bunker. So it's the last thing that we've got anywhere near or in Berlin, which is pretty well identical in construction and in atmosphere to Hitler's bunker. Hitler's bunker was only supposed to be an air raid shelter, and that's why it looked exactly like this. We've got a little bit of flaking off the walls now, but it was the same kind of paint, it was the same kind of dimensions, the same kind of flooring. These bunkers cover an area of nearly 53,800 square feet. It was the German military communication nerve center, the Nazi equivalent of the Pentagon. To protect it from Allied air attack, the engineers didn't just bury it 36 feet below ground. They also gave it an impenetrable roof something Hitler wanted in his bunker, too. 
This is three meters of reinforced concrete, reinforced with steel rods. Now, over Hitler's bunker, he had 4.5 meters of reinforced concrete, designed to protect him from anything that either the Soviets or anybody else could throw at him. Hitler's bunker was his refuge, but it still needed to function as a command post, and that meant it needed a self-contained and fail-safe source of power underground. This created its own problems. They smelt, they smelt of the diesel that was coming from the power plant. Two Mark 7 U-boat diesel engines were providing power for electricity and for communication, and it's amazing how Spartan they were. In Berlin, the city begins to transform into a fortress, with Hitler's bunker at its core in the citadel, like the keep of a medieval castle. The principles of defense in an urban environment like this haven't really changed since the medieval era. The difference is that obviously here, the scale of the battle is far larger. We talk about moats and waterways, and indeed getting a high vantage point for observation and uh, lines of covering fire. Hitler's bunker is in the middle of the fortress. Like a castle, it is surrounded with water. The River Spree and Landwehr Canal encircle the citadel in a natural moat. The next layer is the three flak towers, fortresses 164 feet high, each bristling with 20 anti-aircraft weapons. Only one still exists, and access to its extraordinary interior is limited. Local guide Sean Davies is an expert on their construction. We're standing on the only side of the building that still survives, the north face of the flak tower. And it really gives us an idea of the scale of the building. These flak towers will soon become the most important defensive structures in the whole of Berlin but they get their start when Allied forces begin to bomb the city. The first British bombing raid found Berlin relatively lightly protected. The reason is very simple. The Nazis had traditionally not thought that the British, and indeed any other air force, would successfully bomb Germany. Hitler needs to protect Berlin, to preserve it for its future as the capital of his empire. The Nazis immediately embarked on a building program to create air raid shelters and fortresses uh, to protect the cities from future bombing raids. And that's what Hitler was involved in. The flak tower design is Hitler's brainchild, and he employs his favorite architect to oversee the project, Albert Speer. This is how I see the new flag towers. Are they a viable design? Of course. They are impregnable. And they'll be guarding this new fabulous city of ours for centuries. Well, Albert Speer is a very interesting character because he's an architect and he buys into Hitler and he buys into what, what the Nazis represent, but he's a hugely capable, clever, highly motivated individual. Hitler's design requires over 100,000 tons of tough concrete and steel. Every day, 3,700 tons is shipped to the capital just to build the flak towers. The railway timetable is changed to accommodate a never-ending stream of material. Despite their scale, each of these bastions of Fortress Berlin are constructed in just eight months. The flak tower was all about elevating the most powerful cannons in the uh, German arsenal above the city rooftops, giving them a perfect field of fire. The square tower had four turrets, each with dual 128 millimeter flak guns, powerful weapons designed to bring down Allied bombers. 
But when the Russians arrive, these guns will be pointed down at the streets. One of the soldiers tasked with manning these flak tower guns is 18-year-old Dieter Borkovsky, who kept a diary recounting his exploits. By 1945, teenagers like Dieter are typical of the inexperienced troops left to defend Hitler's capital. Can I help you? Um, Please, may I apply for a weekend leave pass? To see my mother. Your name, please? Dieter Borkowski. Ah, similar to mine. Dombrovsky Inge. Where are you from? I'm from Berlin. At just 18, Nazi Germany is all Dieter has known. He will soon have to defend his family, his Fuhrer, and his nation. February 1945, the Soviet forces camped on the River Oder plan their attack on Berlin as their army grows with reinforcements from Russia. The Allies send their bombers to flatten Berlin and ease the way for the Russians to invade. From this height, we could look out straight over the northern approach to Berlin. And of course, the anti-aircraft guns would have had absolutely no problem turning and facing in any direction that the enemy bombers were using to fly into Berlin. On top of the flak towers, anti-aircraft gunners battle to bring down the Allied planes. With guns capable of firing eight miles, they can create 360 degrees of cover. the sheer power of these weapons must be calculated into the building's design. Every time a shot was fired, it created somewhere in the region of 40 tons that punched down onto the building. And the cannons working together could fire around 100 times a minute. So you're talking about 100 times a minute, a 40-ton hit on the building. To withstand the recoil from the guns, Albert Speer had engineered an ingeniously simple solution, a bed of sand beneath the flak tower. And that bed of sand was then meant to work a little bit like a shock absorber. Every time the guns fired, the vibration would pass through the building, but get absorbed with that bed of sand and stop the building from ripping itself to pieces. The Allied bombers directly hit the flak towers numerous times. But Albert Speer's design is working. The sheer volume of material in the structures makes them indestructible. The man responsible for what remains of these flak towers is Sasha Kiel. This is a very good point to show you how thick the wall was. Uh, we have here two meters of steel concrete, and I'm standing in the wall. You have to imagine that the ceiling is double. Uh, four meters of steel concrete and more. The tower stretches over six floors, each one the size of a football pitch. With the military living quarters and command posts at the top, the lower levels provide ample space for civilians. So down below us is the freight elevator and it allows us to look almost right to the bottom of the building. The bombing of the city is relentless. Berliners turn to the enormous flak towers for protection. Over 15,000 crowd into each one. In the citadel, Hitler also seeks shelter. 
he has no choice but to move his command center underground into the safety of his bunker. Hitler is determined to fight to the end, to fight for every yard, and he's not going to leave Berlin. He's going to hunker down in his bunker and stay there till the bitter end. And the Nazi elite have access to other purpose-built shelters. So here we're in a Luftschutzraum, uh, an air protection room, an air raid shelter. This is actually quite a small shelter, but it would have been packed, especially towards the end of the war. We've got some sort of light comedy on the wall around me. It's enough, perhaps, just to um, make this place seem more homely. The design of these elite bunkers used the latest engineering techniques. So what we've got within this sort of a, an air raid shelter is actually quite a sophisticated method of raising air pressure within the bunker space to act then as an air lock against the potential of, of gas or, or smoke from fires that might occur outside the building. Doors and windows seal the room. Air is then drawn in through a charcoal filter, removing any poisons from gas or fires outside, like the panic room of a skyscraper. After every raid, Berliners like Dieter Borkowski emerge to find their magnificent city bombed into oblivion. When you look at pictures of, of Berlin, by the spring of 1945. This is a post-apocalyptic world. It's a world of shattered buildings, of barely a single pane of glass still intact. There's rubble everywhere. There's gaunt, thin, emaciated people. There's disease. There's open sewage. This is a town, a city, that has already been destroyed before the Soviets have got within artillery range of the capital. The people of Nazi Berlin must now prepare their damaged city for battle and extend the fortress beyond the flak towers to the outskirts of the city itself. People below and above military age are mobilized for the so-called Volkssturm, the people's storm. Hitler used to call into uh, military formations also. Uh, this is a massive effort to bring every resource to bear, both human and material. Their job is to construct Hitler's vision for Fortress Berlin, the inner and outer defensive rings that will protect the Fuhrer in his bunker. You're talking about 14-year-old kids, 60-year-old men, and told, go and defend the Reich, go and defend your capital, go and defend your family. An army of citizens work daily to dig ditches and lay mines, preparing for the final battle. Among them is Dieter Borkowski, drafted in to build tank blockades at the inner defense ring. Boys, keep going. Put your backs into it. The Führer's well-being depends on you. They were building all sorts of defenses here. There would be trams filled with rubble, for example. They would be bringing railway sleepers. They were creating, if you like, thick castle walls of whatever materials came to hand. Although there was a joke about this. The Berliners said uh, that it would take about 20 minutes for these obstacles to be overrun, 10 minutes for the Soviets to stop laughing at them, and 10 minutes then to drive through them. Berliners are terrified of the advancing Russians. They have a fearsome reputation. Earlier in the war, the Nazi army had marched all the way to the gates of Moscow, inflicting brutal atrocities on the people who stood in their way. But when the war turned, 
the Russians fought all the way back to the edge of the German capital with one thing on their minds. The Soviet army had fought relentlessly through areas that uh, extended from Stalingrad all the way to the gates of Berlin. They'd seen horrific things. They had seen what Nazi soldiers had done as they progressed towards, through its, the occupied territories where the Reich had been. And they arrived at the gate ready to take revenge. Refugees fleeing from the east arrive in the city with tales of the treatment Berliners can expect from the Soviets. Silence! What did she say? Nothing. Don't lie! She said, when the Russians come, they take us to the mines in Siberia and our women will all be turned into prostitutes. March 1945. After camping on the River Oder for two months, the Soviets have stockpiled over seven million shells ready to fire at Berlin. The Allies in the West have crossed the River Rhine. Against the advice of his generals, Hitler is determined to defend his capital, even without his promised wonder weapons. Albert Speer, his architect, came to him and said, listen, we need to do something in order to protect German industry so that we can rebuild properly after the defeat. Hitler said, after the defeat? Are you kidding? There will be no defeat. And the next day issued his Nero order, scorched earth policy, that Berlin would not be left standing with anything of value that Soviets could use. The enemy will leave us nothing but scorched earth when he withdraws. Without paying the slightest regard to our population. I order anything of value which could in any way be used by the enemy to be destroyed. Nothing should be left. Nothing! In a stunning turn, Hitler proposes demolishing industrial complexes, strategic railways, and ancient bridges. Destroying priceless architectural wonders is something that horrifies his chief architect, Albert Speer. At this stage of the war, it makes no sense for us to undertake demolitions which may strike at the very life of the nation. We must leave nothing for the Russians. But by destroying everything? If you could believe that the war can still be won, if you could at least have faith in that, all would be well, do you? I cannot with the best will in the world. I do not want to be another swine in your entourage who tells you they believe in victory when I don't. You have 24 hours to think over your answer. March 30th, 1945. Albert Speer bends to Hitler's will. He starts the strategic demolition of the Nazi industrial machine. 30 miles away, the Soviet forces are camped on the west bank of the River Oder, 10 miles from the first line of defense, Zalo Heights, ready to attack. They have now assembled 41 heavily armored divisions and over 9,000 assault guns. The Russians weren't even considering attacking unless they had 10 to 1, and preferably 40 to 1, at least, at the main point of attack. In other words, overwhelming numbers. One million Russian troops, 2,500 tanks, and 1,500 rocket launchers. Hitler's generals know they are hugely outnumbered, but the Fuhrer won't listen to their concerns.
Please, generals. They tell me this is not possible and that is not possible. Unbelievable. The army must hold the Russians at the order. The sort of 30 miles to Berlin between the, the river Oder and the capital is open. So this is your sort of last defense before the Red Army reaches the capital, the heart of, of the Third Reich. The German generals know the only way to hold back the Red Army is to take advantage of natural terrain between the Soviet camp on the river and the capital. So we are standing on the Zelo Heights, and this is the last high ground before you get to the city itself, making this an ideal position for the Germans to then defend. From Zelo Heights, the Germans will see the enemy's 2,500 tanks advance. The Nazis need to reduce Russian tank numbers and even the odds. Ingeniously, they exploit what already exists in the German countryside. So they're going to adapt the irrigation ditches that crisscross this uh, landscape, and they're going to adapt them to form anti-tank ditches. An anti-tank ditch must be wider than the length of the tank tracks, so it can't drive over the top. The ditch edge is angled to 70 degrees, gentle enough for the tank to drive straight into the trap. So they will have to be bridged by engineers. That will cause the tanks to stop. A static tank is easier to hit than a moving tank. And again, around these obstacles, you can concentrate anti-tank weapons. The Germans create over 36 miles of trenches and anti-tank ditches to defend Zelo Heights. The final battle the fight for Berlin begins at 3 a.m. on April 16, 1945. At first light, Russian tanks and infantry surge forward. The Soviets were in a rush at this point. They wanted to make their way as fast as possible into Fortress Berlin. But at the end of the first day, the Russians still haven't taken Zelo Heights. To their horror, they discovered that the German defenses were much more effective than they had imagined. Amazingly, even though they are outnumbered 10 to 1, the Germans hold back the mighty Red Army for four days. No amount of German ingenuity and solid, determined defense was going to last forever. It really was only a question of time before sheer weight of numbers and dogged determination on the Soviet side won the day. Eventually, Russian engineers bridge the tank traps, and on April 19th, the Soviets overcome Zelo Heights. They have lost over 30,000 men and 700 tanks, but are one step closer to Berlin. At the Führer bunker, Hitler is celebrating his 56th birthday. In what will be his last public appearance and the last footage of him, he greets a selection of the Hitler youth who survived Zelo Heights. Adolf Hitler is congratulating and indeed decorating boys with medals of honor, the Iron Cross, for their courage in taking on Soviet tanks, in many cases, at close range. Outside Berlin, nearly 2,000 Russian tanks are storming toward the outer defense ring of the city. To combat these tanks, the Nazis have a revolutionary weapon, a lightweight anti-tank missile launcher, the Panzerfaust. No, 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 stupid! You have to keep it down. Have a look, I'll show you. This groundbreaking missile can pierce nearly four inches of armor at a range of 330 feet. The 
Panzerfaust, literally the tank fist, was ahead of its time. It was very simple technology. In fact, uh, you could give this to a young boy or an old man, and they would fire it with confidence because this is a recoil-less weapon. There's no kick. And indeed, uh, if you can get close enough to the tank, you can be confident that the warhead will do its work. In the city, Berliners old and young train with this latest in Nazi weapon engineering. And soon, they will be tested. The Soviets reach the Telto Canal. 25th of April, the Soviet Red Army managed to cross this canal. Somehow they get inflatable boats across here. Uh, they then establish a bridgehead, and then they're bringing up barges to create improvised pontoon bridges to bring more infantry and more Soviet armor, more tanks uh, in their wake. They are then moving, and moving fast, up to the next concentric ring within Berlin's defense system, the inner ring. The Telto Canal, Berlin's outer defense ring, crumbles in just four days. The Soviets are now less than four miles from the Führer bunker. Hitler's generals want to flee, and he is furious. You all offer me cowardice and baseness. All around me is disloyalty. For years, you, my generals, have resisted me constantly. For years! You are traitors! Traitors! I can no longer lead you, villains. Every order, a waste of my breath. But, gentlemen, if you believe that I will leave Berlin, you are sorely mistaken. I'd rather put a bullet through my head. Hitler is going nowhere. He still believes his fortress Berlin will not fall to the Soviets. But they are closing in fast and have reached one of the most formidable structures in the inner defense ring, Tempelhof Airport. As a command post, this is where you've got food stored, ammunition stored, everything that's required for a defense is going to be concentrated in this particular kind of a building, in this fortress within a fortress. It is an important prize for the Soviets, as they desperately need an airport to resupply their exhausted army. But the Germans have turned the airport into a stronghold. So what you've got here is a series of towers behind me. It's like a castle in that respect. Call it the Great Wall of China in a way. Uh, you've got these flat towers where you can sight artillery without a problem. And uh, indeed, this is a raised trench wall in a way. You can uh, sight artillery behind this visual screen that could fire then at a higher elevation and take on uh, the Soviets. The fighting is intense, and evidence of it can still be seen in the burnt out tunnels under Tempelhof. This would have been a really confusing, chaotic environment. Lots of noise, people shouting orders to and fro when you're coming into these spaces with the electricity out, filled with smoke and dust, brick dust and what have you. Eventually, the sheer volume of troops in the Red Army wins out. And by April 27th, the Soviets have control of Tempelhof. It is a massive strategic victory. Just 36 hours after the battle ends in this particular place, they're actually flying biplanes into this uh, particular part of Berlin to get Soviet casualties out, resupply, fighter aircraft are coming in. The Soviets resupply and push on. They face strong resistance from the remaining Berliners defending the city.
Berlin has been hit with over two million artillery rounds, and the resulting debris forms natural tank obstacles and barricades. The more confusing the terrain for the tank, the better chance I have of catching that tank at close range, I'll take out the turret, and then take out the main armament in the process. Russian tank superiority counts for little, as the Hitler Youth, with their portable Panzerfaust, adopt hit-and-run tactics. Every Berliner, old, young, military or civilian, is fighting for survival. As the Soviets push through the city, some Berliners choose to surrender rather than die. But Hitler's feared SS soldiers terrorized citizens into fighting. There would be roving execution squads made up of SS and Nazi party fanatics who were actually uh, a big problem for anyone trying to stay out of the action because you could be picked up as a deserter and hanged then and there. And this was, of course, to discourage others from staying out of the battle too. Soldiers and civilians accused of desertion hang in the city, a warning to any who try to flee. Trying to get back to his flak tower, Dieter runs straight into an SS officer. A deserter, aren't you? I'm not a traitor. Not a traitor, eh? Traitor. Cowardly pig. You wanted to flee. Hmm? <laughs> Lieutenant, I'm not a traitor. I would not desert. All traitors and deserters are to be rounded up and liquidated by any means necessary. Round him up with the rest of the scum and shoot him. I'm not a traitor. I don't want to desert. I'm not a traitor. I don't want to desert. I don't think there was any clear way out for the average Berliner at this stage. You were either going to be picked up as a potential deserter by these execution squads of SS, or if they didn't get you, the Soviet Red Army would be beyond your doorstep within the next few days, if not hours, towards the end. Dieter is one of the few to be spared, as every hour, the Red Army inches closer to the Führerbunker and Hitler. Berliners driven back by the advancing tanks seek refuge in the indestructible flak towers. But somewhere in the region of 15,000 civilians should have come inside. The key word there is, of course, should, because we know that people were crowding into these buildings, three to four times the official number of civilians pushing their way inside. Up to 60,000 citizens cower in each of the three flak towers, relying on the mass of concrete for survival. Outside, the Red Army throw everything they have at these last great Nazi structures. The Russian tanks stood over there some uh, 300 meters and uh, they tried to blast through the three meter strong concrete, steel concrete wall, but they didn't manage. Despite the entire might of the Soviet Army being turned on the flak towers, they are still standing. They were able to resist the Soviets. They couldn't do anything about the Soviets swallowing up the rest of the Berlin, which simply meant, of course, that the Soviets uh, just had to wait. At some point, the people inside would have to give up. The Russians simply leave the flak towers and flood past towards Hitler's bunker and the Reichstag. The next defensive line is the water surrounding the citadel, the Germans have blown every bridge across, 
except one. The outer ring of defense has been broken. The inner ring of defense has been broken. And now we are at the defense line for the Citadel itself, the Citadel on the other side of the water here. But German army engineers have failed to break, and destroy the Moltke Bridge. This bridge is the last major defensive strong point between the Soviet army and Hitler's bunker itself. April 28, 1945. At dusk, the Soviets launch their attack on Berlin's citadel. If they can seize control of the Maltka Bridge, the city will fall. This bridge was heavily and bitterly defended. The closer that you got to the citadel, the more desperate and the more fanatical the troops would become. Defending this bridge is the last hope for the Nazis. If the Soviets cross, they are less than a mile from their ultimate prize, Hitler in his bunker. It was extremely important for the Soviets to get the body of Hitler, to be able to show it to their public. They had fought so hard against him, against a regime that was a top-down regime, with Hitler as the leader, the Fuhrer. The Soviets secure the bridge by midnight. They are at last in the citadel. There is now only the Fuhrer bunker between the Soviets and Hitler. He puts his last plan into action. On the 29th, he marries Eva Brown, his long-term mistress, rewarding her for her misplaced loyalty. On the 30th of April, at approximately 3.30 p.m., he will commit suicide with her in the bunker itself. Hitler knew what had happened to Mussolini in Italy. He'd been urinated on in public. He'd been taken and hung in a main square in Milan. Hitler had his body incinerated in order to avoid that fate. From the Führer's headquarters, it is announced that our Führer, Adolf Hitler, this afternoon at his command post in the Reichschancellery, fighting till his last breath against Bolshevism, fell for Germany. After the news of Hitler's death, Berliners felt abandoned and betrayed by the man who had set himself up as their leader, as if you like the father of the nation. Inside the flak tower, Dieter discovers tragic casualties. Nearly 4,000 Berliners decide to end their lives during the battle instead of surrendering to the Soviets. Uh, the sergeant. Have you seen Inge Dombrovsky? She is dead. Lieutenant Seidler shot her. The Soviets are outside the government buildings and the Reichstag. Three attempted assaults are held off with heavy Soviet losses. They have to blast their way in through the bricked up entrances and resume hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Eventually, by 2240 hours on the 30th of April, 1945, the red flag of the Soviet Union is raised above this building. That means that systematically, every line of defense put in their way by the Germans defending has been broken by the Soviet Red Army. Beyond that, Nazi Germany is shown to be defeated and the war in Europe is all but over. A modern city, revered just a few years earlier, has been reduced to rubble. Just seven hours after Hitler's suicide, 
Fortress Berlin has fallen. A quarter of the city lay in ruins. 500,000 apartments were destroyed. The infrastructure of a very modern city was in tatters. There was no safe drinking water. You had women forced into slave labor, moving stones from this rubble to clear streets. And more than anything else, the stench, the stench of collapsed buildings with bodies that were rotting under it. The Soviet forces lost over 80,000 men in the Battle of Berlin. German casualties number close to double that. I think we should remember that the Battle of Berlin should never have been fought and that the only reason it was fought was because Adolf Hitler, a man who could always have surrendered and bowed to the inevitable, didn't. And the whole of this city and much more besides would then be sacrificed on the altar of his ego. Speer serves 20 years in jail for his role in Nazi war crimes. When released in 1966, he writes about his experience as the architect of the Third Reich. Dieter studies history at Berlin University and becomes a journalist. He dies of natural causes in 2000, age 71. After Berlin falls, Nazi Germany officially surrenders one week later on May 8, 1945, and victory in Europe is declared. With the Japanese surrender nearly four months later, World War II is at an end. Despite all the military technology and mega weapons pioneered by the Nazis, Hitler's Third Reich has ultimately failed. And over 60 million people have lost their lives in the deadliest military conflict in history. Nazi mega weapons is made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. To learn more about this program or any of the other episodes in this series, visit us online at pbs.org forward slash Nazi Mega Weapons. Nazi Mega Weapons is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.